This is David Spence from the University of Texas School of Law and EnergyTradeoffs.com, and this is the first video in a three-part series that collectively make the case for the importance of maintaining an open and uh, respectful dialogue about the difficult distributional challenges associated with making a rapid energy transition, say, to net zero carbon emissions in the economy by the middle of this century. That dialogue, we think, is an essential element of a strategy for success, and our website, the front page of which you see here, tries to further that objective by highlighting research into some of these thorny value choices we're going to have to make along the way. Each of these three videos is between 12 and 15 minutes long, and this first installment includes a short introduction to the entire project. We hope that the videos and the website will be a resource for students, faculty, and others who want to think seriously about the energy transition and grapple with these difficult questions. We created the website because we think that some of the same centrifugal forces that are fracturing our democracy right now can also push us to ignore trade-offs that'll be at the heart of the legislative politics of an energy transition. That in turn can drive wedges between members of the coalition that support a rapid transition, slowing progress toward that goal. This is a dynamic that plagues most social movements in history, and this one is no exception. So this series of videos is based on a few underlying assumptions that we should make clear at the outset before going any further. First, we assume that Climate change is real and an urgent problem driven by human activity. And in other words, we assume that the net benefits of transitioning to a net zero carbon emission economy by the middle of the century are strongly positive. And second, I'm going to assume here that the transition will require national legislation. That is, despite lots of climate policy progress in the states and powerful market forces that are favoring clean energy right now, we can't get to net zero without national legislation. Federal executive branch actions alone are not going to do it, particularly given the changing ideological tint of the federal judiciary. Congress is going to have to act. So we try to make this argument or this point on the website using quotations, and we use this one from the movie Lincoln, among others, to illustrate some of these points. In the movie, you'll recall that the radical Republicans accused Lincoln of lacking a moral compass because he's cautious about seeking Congress's approval of the 13th Amendment. And Lincoln responds with the quote you see here. He says that a compass can point you in the right direction, but you're still going to need to understand the swamps and chasms and deserts that are in your way if you're going to reach your destination. So this talk is about that idea. It's not about any one particular policy but rather about fostering a political environment that's more conducive to solution finding because there are reasons why that is becoming more difficult. Uh, to explain what's coming in each of the three parts, this part is gonna discuss the longstanding trade-offs that characterize the energy system and why they're still important in charting a path to net zero. Part two is going to discuss why we are particularly susceptible now to narratives that brush those trade-offs aside. The reasons have to do with political polarization, social media, and the 24-hour news cycle and how they influence our beliefs. We all see these distortions at work in the beliefs and words of others, but they're really hard to see in ourselves. The third part discusses why soft peddling these distributional choices now undermines the task of building the kind of legislative majorities that we're going to need to pass national climate legislation given the Congress we have or are likely to have in the near future. There has always been a tension between ensuring a reliable supply of energy, making it affordable, and making it clean. The technological change has made some of those trade-offs easier of late, but it hasn't entirely eliminated them. And it's probably safe to assume that for politicians, the reliability of energy supply, at least a basic baseline level of reliability, is a non-negotiable item. So getting to net zero across the entire economy 
in a time of historic levels of economic inequality means that we ought to pay attention to cost on both political grounds and on ethical grounds as well. The good news is that there are some win-win opportunities out there, especially in the electricity sector. There are opportunities to promote win-win efficiency investments and other changes in consumption patterns. And as this slide shows on the generation side, utility scale wind and solar are now the cheapest forms of generation we have on a levelized cost basis, meaning that if these plants can sell all of their output, they can cover their costs at lower power prices than other technologies can. And as you can see from this figure, there's lots of room in the market for them to grow. In much of the country, we could be replacing more expensive, dirtier forms of generation with cleaner, cheaper renewables. That's a complicated process, but it's, it's definitely a win-win opportunity. And in fact, grid managers have found that they can integrate larger amounts of wind power than they ever thought possible while still keeping the lights on. All of that, however, doesn't imply that a zero emission grid is an entirely win-win proposition. And as we get to very high levels of renewables on the system, the trade-offs start to get a lot more dicey. If we include social costs like pollution, a zero emission grid is almost certainly cheaper. But if we focus on the kind of out-of-pocket costs that consumers and politicians care about, it's probably not. And an all renewables grid, which is an increasingly popular idea among many, is likely to be a more expensive grid than a net zero emission grid that's technology neutral. A lot of smart people have published grid designs that show that an all renewables grid is possible or that a no nuclear, no fossil grid is technically possible, and it is. However, because wind and solar power generate electricity when the wind is blowing and when the sun is shining only, these systems have to be a lot bigger with many extra generators whose output is stored for use later, along with all the transmission to connect all of that new infrastructure together. A lot of this new infrastructure will be rarely needed, so its levelized costs are going to be a lot higher. And we have conversations on the Tradeoffs website with modelers who estimate the out-of-pocket costs of different net zero electric grid configurations. Systems that include so-called firm low carbon resources like nuclear or natural gas plus carbon capture and sequestration or renewable methane, and there are others as well, are significantly cheaper systems than those that limit the technology options. And let's not forget that we don't typically build our new energy infrastructure using the kind of top-down designs that modelers create. We build what private sector investors are willing to build, and we use policy to try and steer that investment. Can we count on investors to build what the models suggest is optimal in the locations that the models suggest? Maybe, maybe not. Might investors be wary of owning and maintaining infrastructure that will rarely be used? Possibly. And even if investors want to build that infrastructure, not in my backyard or NIMBY resistance is sometimes difficult to overcome, particularly in certain parts of the country. New York and New England have struggled mightily to say yes to transmission lines that would bring hydropower from Quebec down into their regions. Both are also struggling to site offshore wind, which they would like to develop further. There are some people who see distributed generation or distributed storage as the solution to this problem, and, and it certainly can relieve the strain on the zero emission grid in some ways, but smaller decentralized generation is a lot more expensive generation, all else equal. So just as the costs of climate change tend to fall disproportionately on the poor, and the social costs of siting new energy infrastructure tend to fall disproportionately on the poor, the way we pay for distributed energy right now in most states also is or tends to be economically regressive. All of these points are varieties of a more general point, which is that when you restrict the solution set, in this case, the technology solution set to a net zero future, you increase your costs. And even in the face of a climate emergency, costs matter. They matter to those with fewer dollars, and they matter to politicians. This is a truism across all of the economic sectors that have to get to net zero. Smart people at various universities, mine included, are working on all sorts of 
fascinating and innovative low emissions solutions for not just electricity, but transport, manufacturing, agriculture, and buildings. We don't want policy to get in the way of or undermine that sort of effort. So let's not do that. Unfortunately, not doing that is harder than it might seem. In carbon policy debates, we tend to look at problems from the top down and fixate on optimal or one size fits all solutions. And we fall into teams, team nuclear, team anti-nuclear, team renewables. Even There's even a team anti-renewables, as you can see on this slide. And all this debate is healthy, but we can't become such tech technology partisans that we oppose progress that doesn't follow our team's prescription. And keep in mind that we are terrible at predicting what technologies are likely to be effective, affordable, scalable, available even in the future. Might there be cheap nuclear power 15 years from now or cheap carbon capture and storage or some form of rapidly scalable energy storage that we don't know about now or isn't affordable now? We don't know. So we should keep our eyes on the prize and the prize is reducing emissions. To a lesser extent, there are also policy instrument partisans or teams, particularly around the subject of carbon taxes, where expert positions pro and con seem to be ossifying often within separate academic disciplines. And people, everyone may have their own well-reasoned preferences. There's nothing wrong with that. But if legislators can only cobble together a majority in support of a regulatory approach that is different from the one that you think is best, one that reduces emissions in a significant and equitable way, and perhaps this is obvious, but we shouldn't become an enemy of the good in pursuit of our own particular versions of perfection. Because cobbling together that legislative majority is going to be plenty hard enough on its own. Let me uh, conclude this first part of the presentation by acknowledging a criticism to this argument that I uh, often hear or sometimes hear. People will say, wait a minute, we're in a crisis and you're talking about downsides and costs and trade-offs. That plays into the hands of political opponents and there just isn't time for that. You're like a soldier charging up Omaha Beach on D-Day, asking his sergeant if he's sure that this is the right beach. That is not helpful. Don't do it. I hope that we offer some persuasive rejoinders to that point in parts two and three of this video series. In the next part, uh, we address the question of how our frustration, our legitimate frustration about the climate problem is channeled into conversations that tend to be divisive, contempt narratives that make us want to narrow the solution set and slow down the solution finding process and away from the kind of productive conversations that might promote understanding across political and ideological boundaries, which is really what's required for resolving these problems in the first place. So this concludes part one, uh, on to part two.